Okay. Um, today is Friday. So typically we do Parsha on Fridays in our class. So in front of you, you should have the Parsha Pearl sheet that uh, Rev. Rick gave out. Um, and I want to go over this together. So we're going to we're gonna listen to this inside. You can read along with me. I want to read the Parsha summary together, maybe share a little idea with you, and then um, tell the story of the week and give you a link to another video you'll watch on your own, okay? This week's Parsha is Parsha Mishpatim. After giving, giving B'nai Israel Ten Commandments, Hashem taught them Mishpatim, laws about how one Jew must deal with another. So it's very interesting. After Hashem gave them the whole Ten Commandments, the big picture, now Parsha Mishpatim deals with how we're supposed to treat another person. And that's such a stress of Judaism. We've talked about this before, the importance of treating other people properly. This cannot be stressed enough. Included are laws about an Evid Ivri, a Jew who is sold for a servant how he must be treated, when he must go free, when the Eved Ivri decides he wants to stay a servant, and laws about the four, oh, and, and when he wants to stay a servant. Okay, before we get to the next part. Uh, it's interesting, when we talk about a, a Jew who sold as a servant, and the word is really servant, not slave, because the way that you have to treat this servant is so unbelievably respectful, he almost becomes somebody in your house. He's definitely not viewed as a slave in the way that we think about that. Anyways, the Parsha goes on. Laws about the four types of capital punishment. A Jew may not wound his parents and he may not curse them. Uh, the Parsha talks about payments for physically hurting another Jew. There are payments for leaving objects or digging a pit in public property, right, and hurting somebody. There are payments if a Jew's animal caused damage, either to a person or another animal. There are laws of what a thief pays back. If the thief admits the theft, he either gives back the object or he gives back its value. If the thief does not admit the theft, rather it is found out by two witnesses, he must return the object and pay a penalty equal to the value of the object. If he stole a lamb and stole or slaughtered it, he pays the owner four times the value of the lamb. If he stole an ox and sold or slaughtered it, he pays the owner five times the value of the ox. Very interesting. What a Jew must pay if he uses another Jew's belongings and breaks them. There are all sorts of laws. If you borrow something from somebody or if you use somebody some something that belongs to somebody else and you break it, you got to pay for that. There are laws about being especially kind to a convert, an orphan, or a widow. There are laws of judges and not to speak Lashon Hara, not to lie. When you see someone you hate that needs help, you have to help him. If his animal got loose and he's wandering, it is a mitzvah to return it. If the donkey is having trouble standing, it is a mitzvah to help him stand it up. The Parsha also speaks about some of the laws of kashrut, not to eat a non-kosher animal, not to mix milk and meat. Hashem assured B'nai Israel that he would send an angel with them to conquer Eretz Israel. At the end of the Parsha, the Torah tells us more details of Matan Torah. What's so interesting is, guys, the Torah cares so much about how you treat somebody else. Look at all these details. This Parsha is full of detail after detail after detail. It's all about how to treat people. Like, why does the Torah care about, like, if I, if I find a lost object, I have to return it to somebody? Or if I hurt somebody, I have to pay them for it? Because the Torah is so sensitive to how I treat other people, how I treat my friends, how I talk to people. Guys, it is so important respecting and treating other people kindly. It's so important. This is my short Dvar Torah for you. Last week was Parsha Yitro. Parsha Yitro is a Parsha, what I call the Parsha of a flash. It's all bang, it's all exciting. You got thunder, you got lightning, right? The shofar blasts, God speaks to the people, Ten Commandments, it's all very, very exciting. Parsha Mishpatim seems to be, I hate to say this, but a little bit more boring. Detail, detail, law after law, it's just a list of laws and details. There are over 50 mitzvot in Parsha Mishpatim alone. So what's the idea? Why do we go from Parsha Yitro, which is so exciting, to Parsha Mishpatim, which is so many details? And just one more point. Parsha Mishpatim begins with the letter Vav. Ve'ela Mishpatim. And the rabbis teach us that whenever a Parsha begins with the letter Vav, it's a direct continuation of the Parsha that came before it. So somehow Mishpatim and Yitro are connected. What's the connection between this big, flashy, exciting Parsha and our Parsha that's got all these details? 
So one idea might be that in Judaism, there are really two important aspects. There's the importance of having these big, inspiring, exciting flash moments, having these big dreams and these big uh, you know, visions. But there's also the importance of taking those big dreams and making it real and bringing it into life. Judaism has a lot of big visions for how we're supposed to live, right? Be kind, right? Big, big idea, right? Big idea, belief in Hashem, right? Big, big idea of being inspired and being close to God, right? Being good to other people. These are very big ideas. But Parsha Mishpatim is about taking those big ideas and turning them into details, little steps of how to actually do it. We don't just care about the big idea. We care about how to make that big idea, how to live that big idea how to make that big idea affect our day-to-day lives. And if there's one thing that I've taught you guys and I continue to bring it up and one thing I hope you take from this class is it's not just about keeping our Torah ideas in our minds as these ideas, but it's bringing it into our heart to feel the idea and then to allow it to translate into action. I got to live that idea. It's got, I got to make it a part of myself. And that's one idea I want to leave you guys with. Okay, story of the week. In the town of New Baranovich, Oh, sorry, one second. I think that might be the wrong story. One second. Let me make sure I got the right one over here. Oh, no, that is the right story. Okay, good. In the town of New Baranovich, Poland, in the 1920s and 1930s, there was no electricity, nor was there any oil or gas system for heating people's homes or shuls. The only heat produced for the shul came from the stove against its back wall. The unfortunate beggars who traveled from city to city relied on the shuls being kept warm overnight, for there they would sleep on the benches. It was the shamus's job, right, the attendant's job, to keep the wood burning in the pot-bellied stove so that those who came to learn in shul in the evening and those who arrived very early in the morning, before dawn, to learn or say to Hillim, would be warm and comfortable. Quite often, the shamish was negligent in performing his duty. It means he didn't, he didn't do it, he, he, didn't, um, he didn't perform it properly. He was lazy, and thus it had become an unspoken rule that the beggars who traveled from town to town would themselves, if necessary, feed the stove throughout the night from the stockpile of wood left alongside the stove by the shamish. However, if there were no beggars stopping over, or if those sleeping in the shul were lazy, by the time morning came, the shul would be freezing. The shamash would then be rebuked by the people who came to davening and learn in the morning. Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov Lubchansky was the Rav in the town of New Baranovich. In order to protect the Shamash, who was very often negligent in his job, Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov would leave his house very early in the morning, while it was still dark outside, go to the shul, gather up the wood, pile it in the stove, light a fire, and blow at the coals until he saw that the fire caught all to make sure that it was warm for the early morning meet palalim, for those people who came to pray. So again, this rabbi would come early to avoid having his attendant get embarrassed. Now, it's so funny because this attendant like wasn't doing his job. He was being lazy. He was supposed to do it. But Rabbi Sarl didn't say, ah, he deserves that. Oh, he deserves to be embarrassed. He messed up. No, he went out of his way. He got there even earlier to make sure that this person wouldn't get embarrassed. After a while, the people began to take for granted that the shul would be warm every morning, and they complimented the shamash for his fine and dedicated work. The shamash, right, this attendant in turn, thought that it was the beggars who in their own self-interest were keeping the stove warm. Nevertheless, he accepted the compliments, rationalizing that it was he who was nice enough to let the beggars sleep in the shul in the first place, even though he wasn't doing it. He took the compliment. He said, yeah, look, I'm allowing these people to sleep there, so I deserve what they're saying to me, even though I, I'm not the one that's actually you know, lighting the stove. One winter morning, while it was still dark outside, Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov came in as he did every day to pile the wood into the oven. The shamus happened to arrive early that day and noticed a man stoking the fire. Good morning, the shamus called out as he made his way toward the stove. Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov knew that it was the shamus. Sorry, knew that if the shamish would realize, if this attendant would realize that it was the rav, right, the rabbi of the community who was actually doing the work, which he himself was supposed to be doing, the man would be embarrassed. So he didn't reply. 
Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov hoped that the Shamish would just go about the business of collecting Sidurim and putting away Sfarim. But instead, the Shamish became offended. Good morning, he yelled defiantly, sure that he was addressing a beggar. He waited for a reply. Rabbi Yisrael went about his work, putting his face closer to the stove to make sure that the Shamish did not recognize him. If he answered, the Shamish would realize at once who he was. Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov just nodded his head and continued to work at the coals so that they would light the wood. In a fit of rage, the Shamish approached the beggar from behind and kicked him, almost pushing the rabbi into the stove. What do you mean, you ingrate? You don't even answer when someone talks to you? By this time, Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov's face was in the stove, and he was coughing from the smoke that was seeping into his lungs. The Shamish gave him one more shove and walked away. By this time, the Rav's beard had caught on fire. Realizing that the Shamish had walked away, Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov quickly turned away from the stove and without a word ran out of the shul, hiding his face so that no one would recognize him. When Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov came to shul later that morning with part of his beard missing, the people assumed that an accident had occurred in his own home. It was only years later when Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov had taken the position of Mashkiach and Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman's yeshiva in Baranovich that a family member revealed what had actually happened. The Talmud, the Gemara and Sota states, it is better for one to throw himself into a burning furnace rather than humiliate another person publicly. Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov Lubchansky, a man in our times, lived by that credo literally. Now again, for us, uh, I don't know if the take-home message is, um, you know, that we should, God forbid, put ourselves in very big danger to avoid embarrassing somebody. Or maybe, maybe we should. It's an, actually, it's an interesting debate back and forth. But the fact is that we have to take this message to heart in our own lives of how serious it is to embarrass somebody publicly. That might mean calling somebody a name. That might mean telling a joke about somebody in front of them. That might be threatening to post a video about somebody without their permission or doing anything that might even potentially embarrass somebody. We have to be so, so careful, so careful in our own lives not to do such a thing. And I think that's a message to take away from this story and a message we should think about in our own lives. Shabbat Shalom.